us this morning for the Monty Hardcast conference. Um, we have really a very good friend, uh, Joachim Schofer, who from Bonn, who's joining us. Joachim is, I mean, one of the most experienced people I know in structural heart. I've learned so much from you, Joachim, over the years. Um, you know, I think the last time I was in, um, I was in yeah. Hamburg with you in the cath lab, uh, you did, I think, in between like sort of eight and, and 12, like five Tavis or something. And then you did two tricuspid cases uh, with Tri-Line uh, just to finish the day. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> you are kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's true. So I've always learned so much from you, for, you know, and you've had an incredible experience with all the different valves, with first in man. Um, so, you know, I think we're all looking forward to listen to you. Um, today, like I said, we have Manaf, who's our fellow, who will take all the questions at the end and uh, he'll give you all the questions at the end. Okay? Yeah, thank you thank very you. much. Please start. Thank you very much. Just a brief uh, introduction, uh, Azim, to you and your colleagues. When I saw the pictures from New York at the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic, I was really shocked. And I asked myself, how can I support those guys who had to work so extremely hard and even risk their own health by taking care of their patients? And um, at that time, just by chance, I received your invitation. Um, and uh, I, I, um, you asked me to, to give a talk for your fellows uh, because they have to un interrupt their fellowship in order to be available in the ICUs. And I can tell you, I did not hesitate uh, for one second to accept your invitation. I'm very happy that I can do this and I have a, uh, the opportunity uh, to support at least a little bit uh, from a country which was not as much um, affected by the pandemic as yours. And uh, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. Thank you. Um, the Tavi overview I'm going to give is quite a simple one, but um, maybe um, if it's too long, you can just uh, uh, always interrupt myself. So, oh, interrupt me. Uh, I have not to disclose, just to make it short, you know, when we uh, decide to, uh, um, to treat a patient with a TAVI, and uh, this has been decided and discussed with the heart team, uh, what we need is a CT to take all the measurements uh, for the diameter of the annulus, for instance, the pattern of uh, calcification, the degree of calcification. Um, the pelvic uh, and the femoral arteries in order to uh, judge the uh, excess from the femorals. Uh, I don't want to go into detail, but if this has been done, and then we do the procedures, and I'm uh, just focusing on two of the procedures, um, uh, uh, two of the TAVI systems today. One is the balloon expandable, and this is the adverse valve, um, as you can see here, which is uh, uh, implanted uh, with rapid pacing, and the other one is the self-expanding core valve, uh, which um, um, sometimes had to be post-dilated uh, a little more often than uh, the uh, sapient valve has to be done. Um, just uh, to, to uh, briefly introduce those two devices uh, I'm uh, talking about when we uh, now talk about data from pivotal trials. This is one of my issues for this overview. And then I would like to uh, stress a little bit the bicuspid aortic valve. Um, and then to valve and valve procedures, uh, talk uh, about stroke and cerebral protection, vascular closure devices. And finally, if we have time on post tablet treatment. So let's start uh, with uh, a brief overview over the pivotal trials. Everything started with patients who were not a candidate for surgery at all. Patients were at extreme risk. So the first randomized trial, the partner one trial, was a comparison of standard therapy, which was a medical therapy, um, sometimes connected with valvuloplasty versus the first generation Harvey system, the balloon expandable um, <clears throat> valve. And um, as you see here, there was a tremendous difference uh, in outcome. The all-cause mortality after five years was significantly different. And uh, you may appreciate uh, the mortality and the st uh, standard uh, treatment patients uh, was, uh, it was a extreme high mortality rate, which is, I think, comparable to the worst case of a cancer. 
Uh, the second study, uh, uh, because of ethical reasons, could not compare any longer uh, versus standard therapy. So a performance goal was set uh, based on the uh, control group of the Partner One trial. Uh, and the, the same uh, what could be gained with the balloon expandable uh, um, valve was also found with the self-expandable core valve, a um, um, almost is essentially the same uh, uh, all-cause mortality rate over five years uh, here, including also major stroke. So when this was done, this was approved by the FDA. So um, this was the first time that uh, uh, patients with extreme risk, uh, patients who were unoperable, so never saw a surgeon in their life, about uh, 25 to 30 percent of the patient cohort, with uh, aortic uh, valve stenosis um, could had uh, had a, a new treatment option. Those patients uh, that uh, during that time were really uh, uh, critically ill patients, old, very old patients, frail patients with a lot of comorbidity, comorbidities. And I really like this slide from uh, Michael Mack. Uh, the, this this um, procedure was uh, still not futile for those patients because these patients were, they were quite old, but they were still enjoying their life. And um, it, uh, it made really sense uh, to uh, keep those patients uh, mobile. So it was logical that uh, uh, the movement uh, came to high-risk patients uh, with an estimated 30-day mortality rate, still above 10%. But those patients were operable. So the next randomized trials had to compare uh, TAVR versus surgery. This was the case uh, with the uh, balloon expandable as well as with the self-expandable uh, stand revealing no inferiority um, compared to surgery in terms of all-cause mortality uh, over a time period of uh, five years. So uh, this uh, was the next step which was done for high-risk patients with approval for, um, for those patients. Then the immediate risk patients followed and estimated a mortality rate between four and 10% at 30 days. And um, again, here, uh, no difference uh, between surgery uh, for uh, balloon expandable as well as for the uh, self expandable stand. Also, this was then approved. Uh, recently, low risk patients uh, came into the focus um, with the estimated mortality rate uh, less than 4%. And these are the patients which are, I think, the, the biggest cohort of patients who undergo surgery nowadays. And uh, the question was, um, uh, does, uh, uh, is TAVR also comparable to surgery uh, in low-risk patients? And the two trials were the PARTNER2 and the EVOLUTE uh, are low-risk uh, trial. Um, the, both trials had different primary endpoints. Uh, the partner three trial had the composite of all cause mortality, stroke, and cardiovascular rehospitalization at one year uh, versus um, the self expandable um, trial. The Evolu trial had all cause mortality and disabling stroke at two years. So, uh, what is the, um, the inclusion criteria? Typical, the uh, um, severe aortic stenosis, uh, low surgical risk. Uh, interesting is what was excluded in those trials. One which was uh, cohort which was excluded was by the bicuspid valve. Um, the bicuspid valve patients, uh, quite a significant cohort of patients we are nowadays treating with TAVR. Um, then uh, the severe LBOT calcification and patients who were not suitable for femoral excess were also excluded from the trial, as well as patients with significant multivessel disease with a syntax score above 32 uh, in the partner trial. Then uh, clinical insufficiency frailty as clinical exclusion criteria. It, it, quite the same exclusion for um, the Evolute R trial. Um, with an, uh, only a lower syntax score, which had to be less than 22, but also by cuspid valves, also unsuitable anatomies, uh, which were in, uh, excluded from these trials. Um, the result is shown here. 
A, uh, on the left hand, you see the uh, difference in the primary endpoint for the balloon expandable valve, which was uh, statistically significant at one year. And uh, just to remember, uh, the primary endpoint composite all cause mortality, stroke, rehospitalization at one year. In contrast, for the evolute low risk, there was no superiority, but there was a non inferiority shown, but uh, for the primary endpoint, all-cause mortality disabling stroke at two years. So two different endpoints, which might explain the two different outcomes. When this was done, this was also approved um, by the FDA. So now you are in the lucky situation that you can uh, treat almost all patients with aortic stenosis in contrast to what we can do in Europe. We still have uh, problems for reimbursement and low-risk uh, patients uh, for TARIS. Uh, interesting enough, uh, the two-year partner, two, uh, partner three uh, data have been presented at ACC this year by Michael Mack and Marty Leon. And I think it's, um, uh, it, it's worth to take a look uh, at this study um, with a very uh, fairly good uh, uh, um, follow-up of the primary endpoint at two years, it was 96% uh, uh, with a small difference between the uh, surgical patients and the TAVI patients. Uh, more patients uh, after TAVI had follow-up, almost 100% of these patients. So and the and echocardiographic finding shown here, uh, as expected, the mean gradient did not differ between uh, uh, surgery in TAVI. Um, uh, what is uh, the difference between this valve and the superannular valve that here um, there was no significant difference in the gradient uh, between surgery and TAVI. Um, the gradient for the uh, Evolute uh, was a little lower because of the uh, superannular physician. Um, Paravalvular leaks um, were um, not found um, to be moderate or severe in any of the groups, but uh, there was, as expected, a significantly higher rate of uh, mild regurgitation in patients um, undergoing TABR. Um, I would like to stress this, but because, uh, you know, um, we all know that paravalvular leaks, if they are more than uh, mild, have a significant impact on uh, the prognosis of the patients, and we should not leave uh, a more than mild um, uh, uh, AR uh, behind when we do a TAR. Um, I can just uh, show you an example um, for a patient who had a significant uh, paravalvular leak. Uh, I have done this, I think, uh, 10 years ago, putting the sapien. XT26 uh, um, valve into this, um, into this uh, um, let me see how yeah, it runs, and to the aortic stenosis. And this was um, followed by, uh, by uh, Uchot showing a significant um, AR, which uh, we, I don't want to leave behind. Unfortunately, the patient was unstable, so uh, I had to retrieve the wire before, uh, so uh, we had to recross the valve and then do the post dilatation. Um, this has been done, and uh, as you see here, um, do you get an idea what happened? So uh, you see uh, the valve is not any longer in its position, but it's um, squeezed and uh, dancing in the descending aorta. So what happened here was that um, instead of uh, crossing the valve, uh, I uh, just uh, crossed the paravalvular leak, which should have been quite big because I could uh, um, introduce the balloon without any resistance. And um, you know, the patient um, got unstable, so I put a second valve in, and uh, then uh, we had to uh, struggle with this uh, squeezed uh, valve in the uh, descending aorta. There was unfortunately an aneurysm, so I could not uh, really uh, fix it there, um, uh, only by using a snare, stabilizing it, then um, dilating the squeezed valve. Um, 
uh, with a uh, up to a 28 millimeter balloon and then I had to use the covered stand in order to fix it in the, the ascending order. So this is uh, how you do, should not do a post dilatation. Um, you should always be um, uh, sure that uh, if you cross the valve and you have to recross the valve that uh, you do not cross it parabola but you, you uh, cross it um, uh, really bubbler. So going back um, to this um, a partner free trial uh, and to the two year data, the primary endpoint um, was still significant after two years, as you see here. But the gap between the two curves uh, were uh, small, it was smaller. Uh, when we look at the uh, different components, uh, like death, which was borderline significant after one year, was not any longer or was far away from significance at two years. And um, the, we're looking at the causes of death, most were um, uh, cardiovascular death in both groups. Uh, what about the stroke rate? The stroke rate was significant after one year in favor of the TARA group uh, and lost its significance after two years. So there were more strokes between one and two years in the TARA group. And um, you see that half of those strokes, which happened on the left hand of the slide, were um, disabling strokes. The other uh, half was dis non disabling, like one di non disabling stroke in the surgical group. I think this is something uh, which is of concern. And, and when we look at stent thrombosis, maybe we find uh, an answer for that. And the stent thrombosis rate in two years was at uh, 2.6% for the TAVA group, uh, which was significantly higher than for surgery, and that was 0.7%. And um, does valve thrombosis impact, uh, has an impact on the clinical events? Yes, it does. It has. You see that uh, patients who had valve thrombosis experienced um, uh, cerebrovascular events or a syncope. Um, uh, in four of those cases, and one of this patient uh, at the time of diagnosis and the other patients some month after the diagnosis. And uh, those patients uh, who were under, uh, under oral anticoagulation had a risk of bleeding. So uh, when we conclude uh, the, 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 the results from the PARTNER 3 trial, um, in this um, defined population with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, excluding for patients, for instance, with bicuspid valves or severe calcification, um, there was uh, still a significant um, difference in the primary outcome um, at two years between surgery and uh, TAVR, but uh, there were more death and stroke events in the TAVA group and the time interval between one and two years with no significant difference any longer at two years and there was an increased uh, valve thrombosis uh, event rate in the TAVA group compared to surgery. I think this is something we really have to uh, take into account and uh, have to keep in mind uh, when we um, look for patients with lower risk uh, even uh, moving to patients with younger ages. So uh, I would like to, to leave this part uh, for uh, of pivotal trials and come to uh, a, a another, I think, quite important subset of patients, patients with bicuspid uh, aortic valves. Um, uh, looking at the classification, uh, type one is uh, by far the, uh, has the highest prevalence. And uh, the, the most prevalent uh, among type 1 is the type 1A, which is the roughly between the right and the left uh, leaflet, followed by uh, type 1B, which is um, the roughly between the right and the non-coronary cusp. And uh, type 0 uh, is quite a rare uh, situation uh, we, we have uh, when we uh, uh, are and discussing TAVIS. Uh, patients with bicuspid stenosis have been generally excluded, as I mentioned before, from TAVA trials. Uh, and this is because there are several concerns. One is, this is a 
um, mostly asymmetric calcification and, and a very elliptic shape, which may lead to potential incomplete valve expansion and um, also to paravalvular leaks. And there's still a controversy about the measurements. Uh, should we measure at the annular level or should we measure, measure at the supraannular level in order to choose the right size of the prosthesis? Um, an interesting study has also been uh, presented at ACC this year from Ram Valley, um, uh, analyzing the primary results from the Evolute Low Risk Bicuspid um, study with the objective of safety and efficacy of TAVR in bicuspid patients with low surgical risk. So the risk was uh, lower than uh, uh, 3%. Uh, a predicted 30-day mortality. The uh, bicuspid uh, valve had to be confirmed by MSCT patient, of course, had to be symptomatic or if uh, asymptomatic, had to have a high degree of aortic stenosis according to the um, guidelines. Exclusion criteria were younger patients below 60 years, patients with multivessel disease with a Zintox score uh, of uh, more than 22, and patients with anatomical restrictions like a dilated um, ascending aorta, prohibitive LVOT calcification, or um, and anatomic dimensions which were, which were outside the recommended ranges. Safety endpoint, the primary safety endpoint, all cause dis uh, mortality, disabling stroke at 30 days. A primary efficacy endpoint, device success, as defined by the VAC criteria. That means absence of procedure mortality, correct position of one valve, not using a second valve, one valve in the proper anatomical position uh, with uh, no significant gradient and absence of more than mild aortic regurgitation. Mean age, uh, younger than what we know from um, uh, Tricuspid target trials, uh, 70 years, uh, quite a low uh, risk uh, patient cohort, STS 1.4. This is the distribution of the subtypes. Um, as expected, most patients at the type 1A, um, uh, that means the left, right, roughly, uh, and uh, this was followed by the uh, type 1B in 18% of the patients. So what is the, uh, the procedure characteristic? Uh, this is important. The prosthesis choice was based on the MSC annular sizing. So they went for annular sizing instead of supraventric, uh, supraannular. And um, what is expected, most of the patients, and this is uh, recommended, generally recommended, uh, underwent pre-dilatation, a uh, valvuloplasty before the valve was uh, put in. And uh, this in one third of the patient was followed by post-dilatation, uh, I think most probably because uh, of uh, still significant paravalvular leaks. Most uh, valves were uh, 90, uh, were bigger valves, um, um, 90, uh, uh, 29 or 34 um, millimeter valves. Primary endpoint, death or disabling stroke, 1.3% at 30 days. This is a fairly good result. I think um, there were 3.3% um, non-disabling strokes. So there was no annular rupture. I think this is um, interesting. Um, based on the annular uh, measurement, no annular rupture. The permanent pacemaker rate was quite acceptable, 15% for those, for those patients. As expected, um, the um, prevalence of mild aortic regurgitation is a little higher than uh, what we know from tricuspid uh, aortic valves, but still there was no moderate and no severe uh, paravalvular leak or aortic regurgitation in this patient cohort. I think uh, this is uh, really a very nice, impressive result. So um, the authors summarized that TAVI with the evolute uh, supraannular self-expanding valve in low-risk bicuspid patients achieved an excellent early result. Based on annular sizing, um, the device success was 95%. 
low mortality and stroke, low PVL, PVL, no moderate and severe, and consistent hemodynamics across uh, all these SIBUS classifications. Of course, these patients have to be followed. They will be followed for 10 years, and I think it's really interesting to see um, what the durability of um, and these devices and bicuspid wells will be. So let's uh, move to, a, to, a, to another issue. Um, this is the valve and valve for degenerative aortic bypostesis. Uh, valve and valve uh, procedures uh, have emerged as an alternative to reoperation uh, for patients with failed bypostesis because, of course, it's less invasive and uh, it's less risky. A reoperation is always uh, associated with a higher surgery. So, and the main concern um, of a uh, valve and valve um, aortic um, procedure. The main concerns are malpositioning, coronary action. Oh, uh, can you still hear me? Yes, Hello. go ahead, Joachim. Everything's okay. fine. Sorry about that. Okay, no problem. Uh, so, malposition, uh, coronary obstruction, high gradients. Uh, the malpositioning, I think this is more a matter of the interventionalist, and I think uh, Azim will, will uh, really. Uh, you know, will teach you uh, how to um, how to correctly position a, uh, a prosthesis in the valve and valve procedure. But let's talk about coronary obstruction and the high gradient. Um, the coronary obstruction is quite a rare um, complication. If we look at uh, uh, TARVIS um, in general, uh, the incidence is 0.7%. It's higher in valve and valve procedures, uh, up to 2.3%. That might sound uh, a, let's say, not an important complication, but if it occurs, it's a devastating complication, which is associated with a mortality of more than 40%. So it really has to be avoided or prevented. The risks uh, for a uh, coronary obstruction are the narrow, sinus, a low coronary height, and the specific uh, um, certain uh, designs of uh, surgical valves. Uh, the highest risk uh, is associated with those valves uh, which have their leaflets fixed at the outer part of the frame. So uh, how can we prevent uh, coronary obstructions? You know, one is um, to just pre-place a stent uh, into the artery at risk, uh, leave it there and do the procedure, put the valve in and uh, at the end see you know, if you need the stand or not. And if you need it, you have to retrieve the stand um, into the order and do a, the, the implantation in a chimney technique um, in order to prevent that uh, the leaflet uh, of the valve is covering the ostium of the stent, which can uh, easily happen if the stent is not really extending the frame uh, of the valve. This has uh, um, a lot of cons. One is that um, you never know, you know, um, whether you should have to reassess the coronary arteries. And if you have to do this, it's almost impossible to do it. Uh, there is uncertainty about the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, there, is, there are no data shown uh, long-term outcome after uh, you have done this uh, procedure. Uh, the pro is that it's really quite simple. There's another elegant um, procedure. It's called the basilica, um, which is uh, based on splitting uh, the leaflet. The leaflet, which is... Um, the leaflet that is covering the ostium uh, of the coronary artery if uh, the prosthesis is implanted. This is done by using a radio frequency wire uh, that is, uh, the, the, the puncture is just below the ostium of, um, um, of the coronary artery. Then uh, a flying V is created and uh, by using another catheter from the other groin, um, the uh, leaflet is split and uh, this gap then uh, is uh, preventing uh, the uh, obstruction of the coronaries. 
Uh, you know, it, it's, it seems to be quite cumbersome. Um, uh, I've done some procedures and uh, uh, after a uh, short learning, uh, I think um, it's, it's quite a predictable procedure and not really very risky. Um, uh, there is maybe a risk of embolization, so we always uh, do these procedures in connection with cerebral protection. Um, and, and there is the, the definite pros are that um, and you do not, um, in any uh, term, uh, uh, alter, alter the uh, TAVI post-treatment strategy. You, uh, you use the antiplatelet or, or uh, anticoagulation regime um, as you would do uh, for this patient, irrespective of the, uh, whether you have done a basilica or not. And you have a easier future access to the corners, of course. Um, in some of those patients, um, although um, uh, we have done the basilica, we had to use, uh, I have to be honest, a, a stent in addition um, uh, in the main stem of the uh, left coronary artery um, because it was not occluded, but there was uh, still a, some prolapse uh, of the slit leaflet um, into the, uh, close to the ostium of the artery. So we found it uh, more, more safe to, uh, to uh, put a stent in in addition. Um, this is um, you know, my uh, uh, mentioning on the coronary obstruction and, and then I would uh, move to the high gradients. The high gradients, well, you know, when a, a gradient is high um, uh, in a um, surgical valve or in a prosthesis, um, this um, is a reflection of a patient prosthesis mismatch. What is the mismatch? The mismatch is that when the effect, effective orifice area of the inserted prosthesis valve is too small in relation to the body size, and this is calculated by the indexed effective orifice area, taking the area, uh, orifice area of the valve into account and related this to the uh, body surface area. Um, this index, uh, if it is below 0.75, uh, we call it severe PPM for obese patients. For obese patients, it's a little lower. And if it's between uh, 0, uh, 65 and 0, uh, 85, we call it moderate uh, PPM. Why is this uh, important? It is important because uh, it has been so shown from surgical data that patients who end up with a severe PPM have a significant worse, higher uh, all-cause mortality over the next years after surgery compared to those patients who have no severe PPM. Is this uh, often the case? The incidence of PPM after surgery is quite, um, is quite high. It is um, around 45% for moderate and severe PPM, and I think this is a fairly high number of PPMs. And this is the reason why uh, when we use a valve and valve procedure, we prefer super annular valves, which keep the working portion of the native annulus and allowing for a larger effective orifice area. And this is uh, nicely shown here on this slide. I think the difference between the uh, effective orifice area of a super annular versus a balloon expandable valve using the same size of um, and the, and the valve. And uh, from uh, data from, from Danny Devere, it uh, became evident that, uh, and this is not surprising, that uh, using a balloon expandable valve for a valve and valve procedure results in a higher rate of mismatch compared to a um, self-expanding valve. And, and uh, when this is related to the uh, uh, to the size of the surgical valve, which has to be treated, you can see that uh, up to a um, diameter of uh, uh, 23 millimeters, there is a significant difference in favor of uh, self-expandable uh, valves uh, compared to balloon expandable valves. For bigger valves, it's not such an issue. But still, um, if you use a um, super annular valve for a valve and valve procedure, you would end up in smaller valves with a rate of PPM between 20 and um, 24%, which is, I think, something which is not really ideal. Uh, and 
this uh, has also been studied. Um, the outcome of patients undergoing a valve and valve procedure, um, depending on the size of the surgical valve, and uh, what you can appreciate from this slide, the smaller the valve, and the higher the rate of PPM and the higher the mortality. The question is, um, can we correct PPM by valve and valve TAVI? Yes, we can. You know that, yes, we can. I miss this. Um, recently, biprostatic valve fracture, called BVF, uh, in patients has been demonstrated to be feasible, leading to a reduction in residual gradient. And uh, CT re reconstruction showed, and this was uh, verified on a lot of bench tests, that when you crack the valve, there is a single fracture point, uh, whereas the other frame um, is staying in, intact. Um, there are a lot of valves which can be fractured. Uh, some can be modified. Uh, the trifecta, for instance, can be modified because it does not have a plastic uh, frame. It, um, it has uh, more a, a metal frame, but it, it has, does not have a metal ring. The Hancock is the only valve you cannot crack or cannot modify because it, it has a metal ring which, which cannot be uh, cracked. All the others have plastic rings. And, and they can be cracked um, by applying different amounts of pressure uh, with a high pressure balloon, non-compliant balloon between eight and up to, uh, as you see here, 24 atmospheres. I'll show you just an example of a patient with a degenerated mosaic 23 aortic valve, um, a 70 year old female patient who underwent um, this implantation um, yeah, I think 10 years ago. Um, just to make it short, the true inner diameter of this mosaic is uh, 19 millimeters. Uh, we put a 26 millimeter evolute um, because um, we had the intention to, uh, uh, to post dilate and crack this valve. The valve had a gradient after we have put this um, not really well deployed um, core valve into this uh, prosthesis by 25 millimeters of mercury. Then we took a 22 true balloon. So we oversized uh, it by three millimeters in order to crack the mosaic. And this ended up with a gradient of five millimeters of mercury with no aortic regurgitation. So uh, we have started, a, uh, I think a year ago, an international BVS registry. I'm very happy to, uh, to uh, um, know that uh, you are also part now of this uh, registry. I'm really very happy. Now we, this registry is comprising about 15 centers. Worldwide, uh, we have collected data of almost 100 patients and are now um, uh, all about to, uh, to um, uh, look at long-term data for those patients. Um, the first um, 50 patients have been reported at TCT last year. Uh, with a success rate of um, BVF in 82% of patients. If we were not successful, the main reason was that we did not gain a, a residual gradient which was below 20 millimeters of mercury. This was the case in 30% of the patients. Uh, the echo gradient uh, at baseline and finally is, of course, still uh, is uh, um, significant. It's, um, this is clear, but what is more interesting when we look at hemodynamic gradients, which have been uh, systematically done in a subgroup of patients at baseline, after TAVI and after BVF, you can see what you can gain by applying uh, the BVF in those patients, a reduction in the gradient by 15 millimeters of mercury. And I think this difference might have an impact on long-term outcome of uh, these patients. So um, basically we can correct uh, the PPM and the PPM uh, which was present in the patients after surgery in this cohort of patients in 65% of patients, they had a PPM after surgery. Years after surgery, when we uh, put a tower into the prosthesis and do the BVF, um, we um, 
can correct the PPM in a, a quite, quite a number of patients. We just have, could reduce it to 15% uh, with moderate or severe PPM after VVF. Safety is an issue. Of course, one patient died. This patient died because of a bleeding of uh, the perforation of the iliac artery, which had nothing to do uh, with the BVF, of course, with the procedure, but not with BVF. We had two patients uh, with septal perforation, um, but uh, this was tiny perforations, which were well tol tolerated, and the patients are still doing well, uh, although we have done nothing uh, for this uh, um, uh, septal perforation. Um, we have now, this is not included in this um, patient cohort, we have experience with one patient who came back after I think two months with severe aortic regurgitation after a high pressure dilatation. Uh, this is of concern, so uh, obviously uh, this patient had a valve dysfunction, uh, most probably due to high pressure dilatation. That means and this is one of the conclusions. Long-term follow-up is needed in these patients, in particular to, to determine whether the high pressure valvuloplasty on the TAVI has any impact on the durability of the TAVI prosthesis. So um, let's move uh, and see you know, whether I have uh, some minutes uh, left. Uh, cerebral protection, uh, a very brief discussion on cerebral protection. Um, stroke rate is still an issue, uh, of course, um, although there is maybe, uh, it's less often occurring in low-risk patients than in high-risk patients, um, maybe because of uh, uh, different comorbidities also, uh, but the, the most important uh, risk factor is in the neurologist. You know, if the neurologist is um, evaluating um, the stroke rate, you know, it's always higher because in this, I think, is the real stroke rate. Uh, if a stroke is occurring, this is terrible because um, it's associ associated with 30-day mortality, which is 25% uh, 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 compared to patients who do not experience a stroke. And uh, when we look at the timing of stroke um, in 34% uh, um, uh, of strokes, this occurs, I think, in connection, uh, direct connection with TAVI at the day of the procedure uh, in 80%. Um, of all patients, it occurs within the first week. So there is a chance to, re to reduce the risk of stroke by, um, uh, by implementing cerebral protection devices into the procedure. The only uh, one which has been improved is the Sentinel, which is not completely covering, but uh, covering uh, the most important carotids, the carotids, uh, the, the most important cerebral arteries. Uh, all the others uh, are um, uh, protectors uh, of the whole aortic arch. Uh, they are uh, all under clinical evaluation. Um, I know, um, uh, as in that you have done, you have experienced the M block. You have just uh, recently published this uh, first in men uh, in Jack Cardiovascular Intervention, a uh, very interesting device. Uh, we have data from the Sentinel trial, which was a randomized control trial uh, with uh, the efficacy and primary endpoint of median total new lesion volume as assessed by diffusion weighted MRI and a safety endpoint which was the MACE at 30 days. Um, unfortunately um, this uh, trial was concerning the primary endpoint negative. There was no statistically significant um, difference in the MACE as well as in the new lesion volume, uh, but um, in a, a secondary endpoint there was a significant difference. Uh, this is the stroke rate uh, within 20, uh, 32 hours. This was statistically significant reduced. Uh, interestingly, uh, Dr. Seegers uh, presented uh, or published data in European Heart Journal um, this is the largest um, level, uh, uh, patient level pool propensity matched analysis comprising uh, more than 1,300 patients, um, showing um, in a very impressive way that um, all cause stroke, um, uh, sorry, all procedure stroke, mortality and stroke, and disabling stroke significantly reduced by using the Sentinel device in these patients. 
This is, however, not a randomized trial. We are still waiting for randomized trials. And the question is, um, uh, before we get these, um, uh, all the data, uh, should we use uh, the server protection or not? You know, our limitation, to be honest, our limitation is the reimbursement. It's not included in the reimbursement, but I think one should um, take it like a seatbelt. So you never know um, whether you get this accident or not. Um, there are no really uh, valid predictors uh, for stroke. So um, I would really recommend if, if it could be achieved financially to use it in almost every patient. Vascular access, um, let me just uh, um, uh, uh, briefly mention our philosophy, it's transfemoral. Out of the last thousand towers, uh, I had one alternative approach. This was a transaortic. Others were done transfemoral. Um, if I have a peripheral artery disease, I treat this peripheral artery disease. Um, I would not recommend uh, doing this. I have done this. Um, uh, contralateral occlusion, occlusion of the uh, common femoral artery, um, uh, subclavian stenosis, which had to be uh, fixed by a stent before we could uh, use a radial pigtail, uh, but did the procedure, it went fine. I, th I think uh, this is really an extreme case. But what is more interesting, what we are using uh, more and more is the intravascular lithotripsy system in order to prepare our patients with uh, a peripheral artery disease for a transfemoral approach. Uh, this is uh, a system which is creating positive sonic pressure waves uh, to modify the calcium. Not, uh, uh, not embolizing, uh, calcium is not embolizing, it's covered, still covered uh, by the intima, which is a in very, very interesting device. Uh, here I show you an example. I've done this today. Um, this is a patient, uh, we went to cross over from the other side and uh, you see these, um, you see these uh, lesions here, um, which uh, were quite narrow. So um, I, I used the lithotripsy. Uh, uh, actually, I used this three days before I did this procedure because uh, based on the CT data, I um, expected to have difficulties. This is uh, the after just the lithotripsy. You see a, a very nice result, angiographic result. So then the next uh, slides, uh, this is the procedure I have done today. You see how easy it was to get the sheath in, 14 trench sheath for a 90, uh, 29 millimeter core valve. Um, this is uh, the positioning of the core valve and this is uh, when the core valve uh, without any predilatation and post dilatation um, was in position and there was a, a tiny parabolic leak which we accepted. Patient was stable, everything was fine. So I will skip this and uh, just uh, let me just briefly mention uh, one important study uh, concerning the post-treatment. Antithrombotic therapy for biposthesis is still a matter of debate. Uh, we have um, low um, recommended classes in the guidelines and different um, different recommendations in the American uh, in, for the Americans and the Europeans for the Americans um, um, uh, there's a class B uh, 2B indication for um, um, uh, vitamin K antagonists um, could be reasonable for at least three months after TAVI procedure in high risk patient and patient with low bleeding risk this is different uh, from our European advices or recommendations, dual antiplatelet therapy or single uh, platelet therapy. Uh, and uh, the no um, uh, anti or anticoagulation is recommended for uh, uh, TAVIS. Uh, how came this uh, into the debate? You know, uh, you know these were, the f I think, the first, um, is the first important um, message we got uh, from uh, Rish Makar and co-workers um, who uh, found hypoattenuated leaflet thickening with, a, with CT and patients with um, um, after TAVI called HALT, and these HALTs, when you look at a subset of uh, patients with, uh, from partner three, uh, the CT subset, sub-study, 
um, that there was a significant difference in heart uh, um, between TAVI patients at 30 days and SAVI patients. And at one year, uh, half of those patients still had HALT and new patients got HALT in the TAVI group, uh, but also in the surgical group. So um, maybe there, it makes sense, uh, I skipped this other popular trial, I don't, make, uh, I don't think it's, it's really of, of importance here. Um, it makes sense uh, to test uh, the uh, uh, hypothesis uh, whether a anticoagulant um, uh, could be effective in preventing uh, patients, um, in preventing embolic uh, events. Um, the Galileo study, this is uh, only, recently, only recently published, is, this, uh, is a study which is uh, evaluating this by um, randomization the patients into two arms. One is rivaroxaban 10 milligram plus aspirin for uh, 90 days, followed by rivaroxaban 10 milligrams alone. Compared to dual antiplatelet therapy for three months, followed by single antiplatelet therapy. Primary endpoint, death, stroke, MI, systemic embolization, system, uh, symptomatic uh, valve thrombosis, uh, or other uh, thrombotic events. And safety endpoints, back to major disabling and life-threatening bleeding. Interesting study, very interesting study. This is the primary endpoint. Rivaroxaban, efficacy endpoint, compared to antiplatelet, less effective than the dual antiplatelet therapy or the antiplatelet regime as mentioned before. What about the safety? Uh, also the safety endpoint was different and also in favor of antiplate of the antiplatelet arm. Rivaroxaban was associated with a higher risk of or a higher rate of bleeding. So um, the conclusion, um, and, and, and this, this is, I think, um, yeah, this was the reason why the study was uh, terminated before, uh, um, the uh, difference in the mortality, which uh, was clearly um, in favor of the antiplatelet therapy. And this was the reason uh, why uh, the trial was uh, terminated prematurely. So um, and the conclusion of this trial is that uh, a, um, after TAVI, a daily rivaroxaban-based antithrombotic strategy is associated with a higher risk of death and thrombotic uh, events as, and bleeding compared to dual antibiotic therapy, something which really surprised me. Okay, it's, I think it's time to finish here, <laughs> if you could, but it could, I could uh, continue because uh, we are on an endless journey, but I really love the quote uh, from uh, Mark Twain, even if you're on the right track, uh, you're going to run over if you are just sitting there. I think, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I'm open for the discussion. Joachim, that was fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. One of the reasons I really, you know, like uh, these sessions is because it's hard nowadays to get a, such a thorough <laughs> overview of the whole field, right? And this exactly was that. I mean, it was a really complete and thorough overview. And I, and I hope, and I'm sure the fellows appreciate it as much as I do. Um, so I'm gonna pass it on to Manaf. Uh, he has some questions and, and there's some questions from the chat. Uh, if you don't mind, I don't know if you have another case immediately, we wanna go, we may go just a little bit over uh, that a lot of time, just to have some time for discussion, if that's okay with you. Of course. Okay. Dr. Schofer, thank you for that uh, whirlwind tour um, uh, in Taver. Um, there's some uh, questions from the chat. First, I had a question myself. Uh, in, um, in bicuspid patients, and, and these patients who we have a little bit less data on, um, how do you balance uh, what we do know with, with patient preference? I mean, a lot of these patients are uh, may hear about uh, TAVI uh, from uh, the news and uh, may come in requesting it. Uh, uh, how do you uh, uh, balance their maybe sometimes strong preference with what may be a, uh, uh, a mild concern, aortopathy, something that's not a severe contraindication, but uh, I'm just curious how, how you have that discussion with patients. 
I think I think it's an important question. You mean the, the, the issue is uh, whether to perform a TAVR or send the patient to surgery? Correct. Uh, I think there are still very strong arguments to send those patients to surgery, especially if the patients are younger. I think um, this is a strong argument uh, for surgery because in particular in patients with bicuspid valves, we do not have any really reliable long-term data on the dura durability uh, of the prosthesis. So um, I think um, <clears throat> this is one. So um, if the patient is, is an elderly patient, I would uh, not really hesitate in um, offering a tariff to these patients. Um, other point is, um, of course, the diameter of the uh, aorta. If there's uh, an indication for surgery for the ascending aorta, of course, this patient is not a candidate. Um, as, uh, I think a third point is if there is severe LVOT calcification and the patient is operable uh, on a fairly acceptable surgical risk, I would also prefer sending this patient to surgery because um, as we saw, you know, the, the, the risk of paravalvular leaks is higher in uh, bicuspid valves and if is, this is associated with a significant LVOT calcification, you, uh, I think, uh, mostly end up with a significant uh, paravalvular leak. Um, the um, asymmetric calcification, if it's a really big chunk of, um, of calcium uh, on one side um, and, um, and the patient is operable, I would also send this patient uh, to surgery. So uh, they, I, I would say, I would estimate in the, um, in, in the patients, uh, let's say above 75 years of age, um, with bicuspid leaflets, uh, 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 bicuspid valves, I would say, um, yeah, 80% I would do with TAVI, 20% with surgery. If they are younger, maybe uh, it's, it's different. Great, thank you. Um, we have some questions here about um, post dilatation. Is that something that should be done uh, routinely? And are you concerned if you have a mild paravalvular leak um, uh, before um, dilation, post dilatation? Um, yeah, you know, if we are in doubt whether this paravalvular leak is significant or not, we still use uh, TE. Um, in, in order to really evaluate it, um, it's, it's better, in my opinion, it's, it's much better than uh, relying just on the root shot. Um, and uh, you can do it uh, in these elderly patients, even under conscious sedation, they tolerate the TEE for, uh, for let's say five minutes. So in, in those cases where we are in doubt, we do a TEE and if we see it's uh, significant, it's more than mild, we do not hesitate to post dilate this patient. Um, <clears throat> it, the experience is um, with the uh, Sapien 3 valve, if you have a small leakage, which is rarely the case, you can wait for some minutes before you decide to post dilate. I think this maybe it's the same for the, for the Evolute Pro. And you can wait for some minutes uh, if it's disappearing or not. Sometimes it's uh, Im improving uh, within minutes and then you don't need this. Uh, but uh, uh, when we are in doubt, we post our late. Great. Um, there's a question about uh, performing balloon valve fracture before a TAVR implant. Is that something that you've ever done? Uh, yes, we have also done this in, in some patients. Um, to me, it makes more sense to do this the other way around because um, our experience is um, when you treat, let's say, a smaller surgical valve uh, with a supraannular um, TAVI device, uh, you do not really know whether you end up with a significant gradient or not. In some of these patients, you have a good reduction of gradient, which is, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the range of uh, 10 millimeters of mercury mean gradient. And you do not need um, a post dilatation. As this is uh, the main reason why we first put the valve in and then do the um, high pressure dilatation if it's really needed, if we uh, measure a significant gradient. 
The drawback is, and we do not know whether this is of any impact, um, that you apply high pressure to a implanted um, tarbid prosthesis. So we, we have one single case which uh, bad with which bad experience. We need more data, definitely more data. We are just collecting long-term data uh, in our registry in order to see whether this uh, is of any concern doing this. Maybe since I have Antonio and Eberhard. Oh, uh, hi, Antonio. Well. <laughs> Hello, very nice lecture, very nice, very <laughs> nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, so maybe this this next question goes to all three of you. Um, so and it's a question that comes up all the time. So specifically to bicuspid, uh, is there one valve that's better than another? Uh, I mean, is there a valve that you think is does better in bicuspid? I don't want to talk about all of Tyler, but just the subset of bicuspid. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, Azim, I, w I wanted to ask that question. <laughs> so, <laughs> before, first of all, uh, 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 Joachim, uh, I mean, it's excellent to, to listen to a lecture by someone who does this procedure, who does not do copy and paste, but does and paste what he does. <laughs> so that, that's the difference between you and many other people. But uh, I don't know, I mean, I wanted to ask Joaquin, in my first uh, reaction would be to consider uh, the sapien as the first choice, the second choice, uh, the evolute, and the third choice, uh, the others. Mm. Uh, but uh, what, what, what is your choice? What is your selection, Joaquin? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, the Evolute, the we have done a, a lot of good experience with the Evolute, especially also with the Evolute Pro, if, uh, if the diameter uh, was uh, su uh, suitable for the Evolute Pro, which uh, unfortunately is not available now for a bigger. But um, we, we have some surprising uh, data on that. You know, my hesitation in using a sapien, uh, let's say in a very calcified bicuspid valve is the risk of perforation. So this is something yeah, I would, Yeah, yeah, I, on, on that I agree. But you know, mm -hmm. I would really uh, do very calcified bicuspid only if the patient really needs it. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, uh, mm. I will go for surgery. I mean, yes. if you're talking about an 89-year-old lady, but you don't really see a lot of those. But if you see mm -hmm. it, uh, sometimes it's better to be safe than to, to look for the perfect result. And you know what happens when you break uh, the annulus is dramatic. Yes. Well, what about you, Eberhard? Um, um, and by Caspers. I don't know how I take this compliment from Antonio. He just woke up, I guess, looking at his hair. Um, and, you know, <laughs> the difference between copy and paste and, and doing it. Um, the thing that I would say, first of all, I think they're all good, honestly. I don't think there's a significant difference. As with all other devices, it's personal preference, which depends on many other factors. If I'd say looking at at the objective data, I would still go with the Lotus first, and then I do the, the Avolute and then the Sapien. In a, in a bicuspid situation, you know, we know all, most of them anyway, have uh, uh, good outcomes, and you can see the, uh, the bicuspid Avolute trial presented recently. Excellent. What, I mean, what, what do you want to do better, actually? And um, I think, as with usual, I, I, my choice, if you ask me my choice, primary choice would be a Lotus, followed by, by Evolute and then the Sapien. Okay, great. Um, However, can I, can I ask a question to you, Azim, and to, and to Joachim, and, and of course uh, uh, the rest. You know, what surprises me was the size of the, of the Evolutes in bicuspid valves and measuring the annulus. Now, obviously, uh, I said on my, on my last um, 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 web conference that you know, there's still a lot of discrepancies and a lot of open questions on what and how to, um, to size the valve. It surprises me that in this particular trial, uh, 
the presentation was mainly the larger valves. Personally, I probably would not go the same way. Um, I would probably more tend to do smaller valves, knowing that you know the the leaflets are the anchoring part, not the annulus. So measuring the annulus, I understand it is one way of doing it, but I think it has some limitations. I wonder how you guys feel about it. Azim, you're doing it. Yeah, so I mean, so just to summarize and understand, you mean smaller valves for, for bicuspid compared to larger valves? Yeah, I, I hate to say undersizing because undersizing means undersizing with regards to what? And then, it, yeah. you know, the, so that's different. Yes, I agree. I think, you know, in the past, uh, when you look at the complications we had with bicuspids, whether that's rupture, whether that's paravalvular leak, or whether that's even the valve not ending up where you wanted it to, uh, most of the reason was we, we chose valves that were too large. So we tried to oversize a lot, uh, like we would for a tricuspid, based on annular measurements. And I think the thing I've learned the most over the last few years. I'm, I don't think it's still very clear how you size, but what I right. do integrate into my thinking is I also look at where the raffi is when it's a bicuspid. And I look at what the dimensions are at that level because with bicuspids, the ceiling can happen not just at the annulus, but can happen at the leaflets as well. So what I tend to do is I integrate both those measurements. And if I'm sitting between two sizes, I usually go for smaller size of bicuspids. Uh, yeah. I don't think you need to oversize it. I think oversizing is what gets you into trouble. Do you think that balloon sizing has any value? I, I think in those intermediate, where you're on the shelf, uh, between the two, I think it does. You know, the one, the one issue I have sometimes with balloon sizing and bicuspids is that you have to then use a large enough balloon to be able right. to make a decision. Right. So if you're sitting there and you're trying to decide between a 26 and a 29 Edwards, I mean, you need to use yeah. a large enough balloon. And then you take a little bit of a risk when you do that, that maybe yeah. you cause a little bit of aortic regurgitation or severe aortic regurgitation or other complications. Um, Joachim, what do you do? Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, this is a strong argument uh, against balloon sizing. We do not do balloon sizing because we, uh, you know, we normally undersize the balloon in order to avoid uh, the risk of rupture. But I agree to Eberhard, uh, we rely uh, more on the another dimension, but then uh, we do not follow the recommendations uh, of, um, uh, of the companies. Uh, but uh, we, you know, <laughs> when, when, we, when we see it, it's, it's borderline, you can do, you can put a larger or smaller, uh, we always uh, choose for the smaller valve. You know, this is a compromise we're doing. And we, um, good, uh, I think we did fairly good with this. We have never had a rupture so far. Okay, we had we had um, some significant parabolic leaks. I, I have to admit, of course. Um, you I can you know you the expert right now, one of the experts on on fracture valve fracture, uh, which and you collected this large data set. And I really do believe valve fracture is now an important technique that we we don't have enough data yet. Uh, but there were a lot of questions on the chat. So I'm going to ask Manaf to maybe summarize uh, all the questions into maybe one or two of the most important ones uh, that you can help us understand, please. Sure. There's a, there's a question here about um, the risk of annual rupture with this technique and, and how do you uh, ensure safety in terms of um, sizing and, uh, and pressure of the, of the balloon that you're using to, uh, to fracture the valve? Yeah. Um, so, um, <clears throat> of course, um, we always perform a CT before, and the CT uh, has, uh, you know, has also has the value uh, to, um, to assess the degree of calcification, in particular, the degree of calcification in the LVOT, because when you do the uh, high pressure ballooning, you must have a, high, a big enough LVOT without significant calcification. Otherwise, we risk a, a perforation. So this is one, I think, very important issue. The other is, in our opinion, uh, not to oversize uh, the balloon uh, uh, according to the uh, IDE of more than uh, three millimeters, uh, not to be too aggressive. Um, 
the bigger the valve, I think uh, the, the, the less aggressive we are. And then, um, you know, the, the pressure you have to apply, it, it depends uh, on the uh, structure of the valve. Uh, most valves uh, can be cracked with a, pre a pressure of uh, 12 to 14 bar, and in uh, some you need 18. Uh, but um, if you do uh, fracturing, uh, of course, you have to apply the pressure uh, to crack the valve, to, to really uh, crack the, uh, uh, the frame of the valve. So how do you size? I mean, so I, I, it's very confusing for me because I guess some people say they go one millimeter larger than the label yeah. size and others say two to three millimeters larger than the internal diameter. Yeah, we, we do it uh, according to the internal diameter and uh, oversize it by two to three millimeters. Okay. And, and maybe the last question that everybody asks before or after uh, you put your new valve in? Yeah, we, we, do, it, we do it after we have put the new valve in. Yeah, I, I, you know, I mentioned the reasons why we do this. Because in some of those patients, you don't need BVF after you put the valve in. Yeah. No. That's precisely, that's precise. I think this is a very, very important statement that Joachim is doing. Why would you do something beforehand if you don't really know the result of a post tavra implant? If the gradient is good enough, you, you know, then you can leave it. You don't know it beforehand. So I would really underscore that, that, that approach, doing it post instead of doing it before. Right. Um, Manaf, any other burning questions? Great. I think uh, we can do maybe another two or three minutes. One um, s sort of question that relates to um, um, the, the question of, of uh, damaging the valve leaflets during uh, balloon expansion. Do you think that this is related to the, um, the increase in halt and, and valve thrombosis that we see uh, with TAVR compared to SAVR? Or um, is that um, just uh, speculation at this point? I think it's really speculation at this point. But it's an interesting question, actually. Yeah, sure. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah. We have to see. Uh, you know, as he's collecting the data, we have to see because we have been surprised with this hard and, and, you know, God knows what, you know, what, what's causing it. So we, we do not, some reasons, but maybe, you know, we, we'll be surprised. That's why I think it's important to get these long-term data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, clearly when you show us the, some of the data, and I think that's been consistent, Joachim, that lethal thickening is more common with transcatheter valves versus surgical valves. Has it changed your practice though? Do you now use more anticoagulation after TAVI or do you still use DAPT? We, we use still DAPT. Um, yeah, you know, the Galeo trial, you know, the, the, um, the issue is that, you know, the, 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 the dosage of uh, rivaroxaban was 10 milligrams. It was not full anticoagulation, it was 20, not 20 milligrams. So we do not know, really do not know nowadays whether um, oral anticoagulation uh, is really superior to dual antiplatelet therapy. We don't know this, but you know, our practice is if the patient is coming back um, and um, we, we see a, an increase in the gradient, we see all the patients uh, every uh, six months after TAVI, and if we see an increase in the gradient and we have uh, yeah, a, a I think a group of about uh, 30, 40 patients uh, who, who uh, um, develop gradient um, during follow-up. If, if we then start with the anticoagulation in most of the patients, you can um, really uh, get rid of the problem. In some, you cannot interrupt the anticoagulation. If you do this, the gradient is coming back. So, but uh, we still do not know, you know, uh, who, who uh, uh, should, uh, sh who needs anticoagulation and who can be uh, treated with dual antibiotic therapy. Great. Great. Manaf, I think maybe we, if you agree, we'll, we'll stop here. We ran a little bit over time, <laughs> uh, but there was lots of great questions. Maybe any final comments, Eberhard, and then we'll pass it on to Joachim and I'll close. No, thank you, Joachim. It was a beautiful overview of what the problems are. You know, just didn't do the device parade. 
but you you tackled on the important questions and Azim and, and your team, it's it's just fantastic that you're stimulating the discussions via this uh, this um, web conference. I, I really always appreciate being part of it. So great to be with you. Thank you so much. Uh, Joachim, really, that was fantastic. Um, I think everybody enjoyed it. We all learned so much. And, and no matter what your level was, you had something in there for everybody, whether you're a fellow or experienced operators like you know, me, Everhard, and Antonio, we all learned something too. So once again, I, we really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Um, and to the fellows, uh, we'll see you next week. We have a good friend, uh, Alan Jeremias, who's going to be talking about a, a practical approach to physiology-guided PCI. So enjoy the rest of your week and day. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thanks, Bye-bye.